Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Adol Korkor. I'm the founder and the CEO of the, and the CEO of the AB Korkor Foundation for Mental Health. Welcome again uh, for our continued webinars to provide education and information related to the impact of COVID-19 on mental health in general. And this particular series that we have, we had one last week uh, with Dr. Ellen Burkhardt, and we have one today was uh, a therapist from the Penfield Clinic, uh, Courtney Clark. The topic is the impact of COVID-19 on children and also strategies for parents and caregivers to provide, uh, 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 to, to, to educate in that regard. Uh, today, we have uh, uh, Courtney Clark with us. Uh, I, we are delighted to have her on board she is gonna. This, she is a therapist at the Penfield Clinic here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, attending to 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 children who have mental health challenges, and which of course has been exacerbated and worsened by the current pandemic. Uh, it's been a pleasure to to have her on board with us. And uh, uh, in regard to any questions that you may have, please go ahead and post them. Uh, we will. Uh, I will be. Uh, I will be viewing them, and then we will have plenty of time at the end of our discussion for uh, Courtney to address those with us. Thank you again for joining us, and I welcome you. And I also welcome your support for the AP Corporate Foundations because without your help, we cannot continue to do the work that we do to help those who suffer from mental illness in our society. Thank you so much, and uh, Courtney, uh, you're on. Okay, thank you. All right, I will pull up the slides here. Okay, um, so thank you for allowing me to be a part of this webinar series. I think this is something that um, a lot of families are really struggling with right now, and so I'm glad to be able to put some information out there. Um, the stuff we're gonna talk about today applies to both families and children who may be struggling with mental health issues, but just anyone in general. I've gotten these same questions from kids who are not having mental health concerns right now. And so I think this is kind of across the board, something that is important to look at for kids and families. So getting started our agenda for today, um, we are going to talk just very briefly about the impact of the pandemic on mental health. I know last week's session with Dr. Burkhardt really went in depth on some of the statistics and research that's out there. Um, so we're, we're going to talk more today about practical strategies. So expectations as well as any strategies you can use kind of in your home with kids and teens. Um, any of the resources I talk about today that are um, websites or online resources that I might mention in the program, I do have a slide at the end that gives the links to all of those so that um, people can have access to them as needed. So kind of getting started. So the impact in general on mental health services, just kind of in a nutshell, for providers um, like myself, the impact has really been that we're also adjusting and learning to this situation as we go. For example, my clinic, we previously were providing no telehealth services, and now we are only providing telehealth services at this time until we can get back into um, the clinic and the homes. We do in-home visits for our, um, for our sessions, so that has been kind of hindered. Um, everybody across the country has had differing levels of limitations for providing services um, based on state, county, city, or agency, as well as um, those of us providing services have also had to kind of cope with differences in our levels of supervision and support systems from colleagues. So that has been kind of a challenge as well to figure out ways to rely on others to kind of help us take care of ourselves so that we can take care of our clients. Um, for children and families, the impacts on mental health have been, um, especially the younger the children are the more difficult it can be for them to participate in telehealth due to their development and their ability to kind of um, participate in a session in that capacity. And so that has kind of hindered for some kids their ability to receive their services. Um, for myself, uh, we provide services to kids ages zero to six. And so as you can imagine, this has been a real challenge. Um, it's a good day if I can get a kid to kind of sit down for um, a few, sit still for a few minutes at a time to even talk with me. And so this has been a huge challenge for our services in particular. Um, in addition, at least in our area, but I suspect nationwide as well, other services the child 
may need may not be occurring um, either in person or at all. So for example, speech therapy and things that really um, can impact a child's mental health as well have not been occurring. And so all of those things kind of exacerbate any of the mental health concerns that kids may be having as well. Um, in terms of expectations, so I kind of broke this down into two categories because this is a conversation I've been having with families the entire time uh, this pandemic has been going on. It's not just about adjusting your expectations for your child. It's also about adjusting the expectations you have for yourself because this is something that we don't really have an instruction manual on how to deal with this. So for kids, we have been seeing a lot of increased irritability, um, lower frustration tolerance. I've seen some um, withdrawn behavior, lack of interest in play, lack of interest in activities. Um, and so all of these things, it's important to kind of keep those in mind when we're looking at expectations for your child. Um, it's also important to still have expectations and still maintain limits. So we wanna be understanding of what kids are going through right now, but also providing the limits and structure that's gonna help them function to the best of their ability. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit throughout this presentation. Um, but one thing I did wanna emphasize is the expectations for yourself. So whether you're a parent, um, a family member, someone who is in a childcare setting, a mental health setting, a teacher, or just someone who is caring for a ch someone else's child occasionally, um, you can put yourself in this category with everything that's been going on we as adults are also experiencing increased irritability, lower frustration tolerance, um, as well as for many of us having to juggle multiple roles. So a lot of things um, parents that I'm working with have been struggling with, particularly if they're working from home or trying to do virtual learning with their child at home is juggling the role of how do I parent and also be my child's teacher or how do I parent my child and keep them entertained or keep them focused while also doing my own work for my own job. Um, and so my mantra to caregivers this whole time has been cut yourself some slack. Um, this is not something that we were equipped to handle before this started for most of us. And so it's okay to not be able to be everything and do everything all the time. So that is one thing to keep in mind. Have expectations adjusted for yourself as well and cut yourself some slack as you're um, figuring out what to kind of do when working with your child. So the number one thing that we can all do for kids, whether it's during the summer months um, or moving into the school year, whether you're doing virtual learning or going back to school is routine. Um, I'm sure this is something that is very familiar to everyone at this point, but I'm going to go over it anyway because it is very important. So one of the reasons routine is so important, especially the younger the child is, is our brains as human beings are kind of wired to constantly anticipate when change might be coming. That's a survival mechanism. Our brains are just set up that way. And so routine helps create a predictability and it can settle that system of your brain down. When kids don't have a routine, their brain is constantly scanning for what's coming next, what's coming next, what's coming next. Even if it's fun, it doesn't have to be a stressful situation. Um, their brain is just constantly kind of thinking about that. And so having that routine can help settle that system of the brain down so that they can focus on other things like learning or play. Um, it also creates a sense of control. Right now, so much about our lives has kind of gotten out of control. Um, and particularly for kids, if they are looking at another school year of not going back to school, but instead learning at home. Um, and so routines can give children a sense of control over what's going on in their environment. They can then take an autonomous role in doing their daily routine. And so that can help them gain that sense of control back in areas where they may have lost it. It can also help kids channel their energy and focus. So when they know what we're doing, you know, for this hour of the day, it can help kind of channel that energy versus during free play where it could bounce from thing to thing to thing um, and be kind of hard to channel. So creating a routine, we're going to kind of go through a couple of examples in the next couple of slides, but the order of activities or what you're doing is up to you, up to the age of the child, how much you allow them to have a say in what they're going to do day to day. Um, Really, it's more about doing the same things in a predictable pattern and less about what that pattern is. So it's really up to up to the family or up to the caregiver. 
But one thing um, that I do recommend often is be mindful of where you put the activities based on where you want your child's energy level. So usually not a good idea if you have a part of your day that has to be really um, calm and low activity like a nap or schoolwork. You probably don't want to have a really high energy activity immediately before that. Um, your child will probably need time to physically wind down. They want their heart rate to decrease, their breathing to decrease. And so going from running around outside to sitting still usually um, does not happen very smoothly. And so kind of creating those um, patterns of energy level throughout your day based on where you want your child to be can be really important. So some examples of activities to include, there are countless, it depends on you, depends on your household, your family, your child, um, who, what the child's personality is, what they like, um, but these are some examples of types of activities. So having a different part of um, the daily routine designated for each one. Um, movement activities can be really good, especially things like dance, um, Zumba and yoga, because it's movement, but it's purposeful. So we're not maybe, um, pushing into the realm of hyperactivity or doing some purposeful movement, but still being physical. Um, one of the resources I always like to mention for that would be, it's called gonoodle.com and it's free to use. And they have all kinds of kid appropriate uh, movement activities that you can do indoors. Um, then you've got physical play, quiet play, music, toys, arts and crafts, um, learning activities. And that's when the school year starts where I would put schoolwork as well. Um, and then tasks and chores around the house. So some of these things, if this isn't stuff your child is normally maybe choosing to do on their own, it could be helpful to set it up in a routine so that they're kind of encouraged to take part in different types of activities throughout the day. Sometimes left to their own devices, kids will um, just stick with one type of thing. And so this will help um, move their focus around throughout the day and keep their mind engaged in different ways. This would be an example of what a routine chart would look like. So when we're creating a routine, I always do something simple like this um, with pictures for kids who cannot yet read. Um, they can be creative about it. You can draw the pictures together or you can just get them off the internet. That's what I did for this lovely example is that's just all clip art that I got off of Google. Um, and it just kind of shows a different way you might lay out the child's day with different types of play throughout the day. So. For families who can't do the same routine every single day, we usually do a routine where you set it up at the beginning of the day. So maybe the pieces of the routine are just taped on and you can move them around. Still in the morning, being for the child to be able to see what they're going to be doing that day is still effective as a routine um, in, in helping them relax that, that scanning of what's coming next. So something else that can be important with routine is have, you, have it be where your child can see it and they can reference it. Um, that's, again, that control piece. If the routine is just in the adult's brain and they have to constantly be asking what's coming next, what's coming next, what's coming next, it typically doesn't work out as well. So having some type of visual that they can, they can see and they can use can be really helpful. So that's the daily routine piece. Then kind of hand in hand with routine often um, is structure. Structure and routine are often talked about together, but structure is a little bit more than routine. Structure means not just what we're doing in our day-to-day -day activities, but also how we're interacting with each other and what the expectations are for the child. So maintaining limits and consistently still having expectations, caregivers or parents responding consistently across the board can really help maintain a structure. So even though kids and especially teenagers really tend to like it and be happy when we relax our structure or eliminate rules or kind of let things slide, and that's okay to do um, some of the time, if we kind of eliminate structure or routine altogether, especially in the summer months when there's really no school routine going on anyway, um, kids may be happy about it in general, but it usually doesn't lead to functioning better. So maintaining some type of structure, especially as we move into possible continued virtual learning, will be really important to kind of help kids stay focused and continue to fun function at the best way they can. So in terms of some strategies for dealing with um, all the things that have come along with, with COVID, um, one place to start would be feelings. So some of the easiest ways we can address these with 
even the youngest of kids is by labeling the feelings we're seeing from the child and the and in the world around us. So when your child is having a strong feeling, label it for them. So it seems like you're really mad that you weren't allowed to go outside right now um, can really help help them make the connection of what their physical state is in their body right now and what the word for that feeling is. And that's going to be the stepping stone to them being able to actually verbally express what they are feeling later. Um, allow them to correct you. So we don't want to, you know, dictate what a child's feeling is. If they feel like they want to say, no, I'm actually happy right now. Okay. Um, we just want them to be kind of hearing those types of conversations, pointing out what you as the caregiver are feeling also very important. Kids learn so much through the adults around them, teenagers as well, even though they may act like they're not paying attention or like they don't care what we're doing. Um, they do pay attention. And so modeling, labeling your own feelings can really help kids. Um, and that's a tricky one because a lot of times the temptation, especially with the younger children, is to not tell them what we're feeling or hide it from them because we think it's going to be too much for them to know um, or it's too complicated for their age. But in fact, kids as young as infants can attune to what adults around them are feeling. And so if even if you don't point it out, it's likely that they, they are aware that you're frustrated or that you're anxious. And so putting words to those feelings can help model for them that it is okay to talk about this stuff and this is what it, what it looks like. Um, and then for the little, little kids, super easy, easy thing to do is to label the characters in books, TV and movies. So looking at a story that's happening in a book or on a TV show and saying, how do you think that that character is feeling right now? What do you think made him feel that way? Um, did how they react, was that smart? Was that a good decision to make? Um, kids have a lot of, a lot easier time talking about that kind of thing in, um, in an objective way about like characters than they do about themselves. So that's a really, really good starting point for any age um, is to look at things objectively in, in media or books. It can also be really helpful to help your child um, learn how to appropriately express their feelings. So it's not that we think they should not get mad about something, you know, even if we as the adults see it as kind of a a silly thing to worry about or react over, they're still feeling the way they feel. Um, so we're just gonna kind of help guide them into a more productive way to express that and to cope with it. Again, that modeling from adults, adults can also model expressing the feelings and then a productive way to cope with it. So your child seeing you do that will help them learn, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do when I'm having these big feelings that I don't know how to deal with. Um, so when we're looking at coping skills, there was a webinar with the Corker Foundation earlier in June on resiliency training that kind of put it in a really good, um, a really good way, which is that a coping skill is kind of an in the moment strategy, whereas resiliency is, is about training and preparation. And that's what we want out of these coping skills. We don't want it to kind of be an in the moment band aid. We want it to be something that kids practice. So the younger the child, the more we have to kind of make it more a part of play to get them to buy in a little bit. On the bottom here, these are some of my favorites because they're easy and you can kind of do them anywhere. Um, so counting to 10 together, the lemon on the center on the bottom there is we have kids pretend that they're making lemonade. So we have our pretend glass and we squeeze either just our empty hands or a stress ball and we squeeze and then we let go of the lemon. And we do that a few times until our cup is full or the pitcher is full. So that helps them release some of that tension in their muscles through their hands. Um, and then the far left bottom of the screen is the cue that I use for deep breathing. Deep breathing with especially the little kids is really tricky because sometimes when you try to coach them through breathing, they actually cause themselves to hyperventilate, which is the opposite of helpful because they're doing it so fast. And so these little pictures are, are what I use and I've had kids draw them or just pretend they're holding the flower in the candle. So what we wanna do is smell the flower and then blow out the candle. Um, and what's really important to note with, especially with younger kids, is they need co-regulation so they need an adult to be doing these things with them in order for it to be effective. If we kind of just hand it over to a four-year-old, a three-year-old and say, you know, take some deep breaths, they're not likely to be able to kind of 
focus themselves enough when they're upset to do it. And so we want the adults to practice it with them. And it's something you can kind of do as, as a whole family to both model it and to kind of create that habit that hopefully kids will be able to use when they are having their big feelings of worry or anger. A narrative is um, something that we use to help kids prepare for or, or process a change um, or something new. There are a lot about COVID-19 already. So, you know, you can probably find them very easily on the internet. Sesame Street has some of my favorites on their website. Um, they do an awesome job at creating things that are very easy for kids to understand, but also accurate. Um, but the the reason these are so helpful is that kids learn really well through stories and they can process really well through stories. It, something about that objectivity of it being a character helps them to process it a little bit easier. So you can either find one that already exists or make up your own. Um, if, if your child is um, willing to do it, kind of having them draw in the pictures for it or be a part of creating it. For older kids, they can probably even write their own and you know, for teens, this might look more like journaling versus writing a story, storybook style story. Um, things you could include are information about the event that is a developmentally appropriate. Sometimes we too often err on the side of caution with the younger kids and don't give them enough information. So really think about what can they handle um, and what is a way to explain it to them that won't be too scary for them, but still gives them facts. Sometimes when we don't give kids the information, they make up ideas in their head of what's going on. And sometimes that can actually be scarier for them than what's actually going on. So giving them some facts um, based on what's appropriate is usually helpful. Um, you want to include feelings that the character may experience in that situation. So with COVID, a lot of the stories we'll, we'll talk about, you know, so-and-so might, might be worried about their family members or might be sad that they can't see their friends. We also use these stories to reiterate the coping skills. So the character then uses the same coping skills that the child has learned how to use um, in order to reinforce those habits. Um, we can also talk about what change will look like. So as we look at back to school, what is the school year going to look like for the character this year? What is she going to have to do? Or is he going to have to wear a mask at school? Is school going to be on the computer? Um, knowing these things in the format of story can help kids predict and then be prepared and not feel as scared about something new, as well as positive messages. So we also want to highlight um, positives that can come of it or um, just reiterate in the story that you know, so-and-so is trying to keep you safe and, you know, you have people that love you, different things like that that are positive messages integrated in the content as well. So we, we use these a lot for a variety of, of um, situations, but the biggest ones that I've kind of talked with families recently about are COVID-19 in general, um, the social distancing behaviors, and back to school. And I believe all three of those topics are covered in some of the Sesame Street ones. So I would definitely recommend for the younger kids checking those out. So some of the things we've been specifically asked about um, through our work at, at Penfield, but I've also heard kind of come up through these webinar series here online um, are about social distancing behaviors for kids. So some things that we have been working on with families are um you know just practicing them at home and when we're talking about younger kids i mean actually like physically practicing acting out what is going to happen like a rehearsal almost we kind of talk about it like a fire drill technique so it's the same way we practice with kids at school what's going to happen when there's a fire drill that's how we want to go about teaching them a new behavior in a social situation is we're going to act it out um so practicing what it's gonna be like in the setting that the child is in. Um, and so for, especially for the younger kids, that could look like, okay, we're gonna play pretend we're going to school today. What do we have to do to walk into the school building? Where do our hands have to be? How does our mask have to look on our face? Um, what do we do when we see our friend? Can we run up and hug them or do we have to stay over here and wave hi from far away? Um, and really practicing those things out um, because kids are quite impulsive um, parents of young kids will probably be able to attest to that um, who are tuning in. And so if we don't kind of practice and practice, a lot of times the child gets in the situation and they're kind of just, their impulses run away with them and they kind of just do whatever their habit 
had been before. Um, modeling safe health behaviors. So whatever behaviors your child needs to learn, whether it's wearing a mask or hand washing or um, staying six feet apart from friends when we're at a play date, um, model those for your child when you're interacting with others as well. Um, and so some of that might be maybe we just practice having time wearing our mask at home, even though we don't need to wear one at home, um, having that time to practice can, can help kids know what it's like and what to expect. Again, shout out to Sesame Street's website. They have so many videos, stories, and songs um, about all of these social distancing behaviors. I've seen a few good videos on socially distanced play dates as well that are awesome. So definitely check those out for the younger kids and use those as a tool um, to help them understand what we're expecting um, in our new normal. And also I mentioned that impulse control, just understand the expectations. Kids ability to control their impulses and self monitor their behavior is not great. Um, that area of the brain doesn't develop until our mid 20s. So as you can imagine, the younger the child, the less they're going to be able to do that. Um, so do your best, but also um, to redirect kids, but also try not to be too punitive when they are not following the protocols because they just really struggle with that impulse control. So they see their friend and they want to run up and hug them regardless of knowing that they're not supposed to. Um, and then praising their attempts and successes at doing some of the behaviors. So kids really love the attention they get from adults. And so if we can channel that attention into what they're doing well, we usually see more of that behavior. Um, practice is really going to be the big, the big key in the social distancing behaviors. Okay, back to school prep. I know this is one we've gotten a lot of questions about, um, so I wanted to make sure we had some time dedicated to back to school. Um, this, the recommendations are gonna be kind of all over the board because across the country, everything is different depending on where you live. Um, for example, Milwaukee County, the public schools are, are starting with virtual learning, um, but some of the private schools are still planning to go back in person. Um, everybody's kind of all over the board on this. And so it's gonna depend on what's going on in your area for your child. But for in-person instruction, using some of those narrative techniques, um, finding books and videos that might help explain to kids what's going to be the same and what's going to be different in their classroom. Ask your child's school for information about how their classroom and their school is going to be functioning. Um, some of the schools I've been hearing about and talking to, they all have different types of ways that they're handling this. And so the more specific you can be in talking to your child about it, the easier time they'll have adjusting. Um, and talk to them ahead of time about what's going to happen day to day and why the measures are in place. So explaining why we're not able to share our snacks and why we can't hug our friends. Um, so that when they're in that situation and they're being redirected to follow these protocols, they don't feel like they're in trouble because of something they did wrong, um, that this is just the new rules of school now. For, um, for the virtual learning, this one's going to be dependent on what your own household situation is. Um, the biggest recommendation is there's that routine again, is having a routine at home for the school day. Um, using actual timing um, on a clock or using a timer to create a structure around time spent on different parts of the routine, kind of mimicking the school day, but also scheduling breaks. So it's a very adult behavior to expect to be able to sit down and do a large amount of work all in one sitting like we do in our workplace. Um, kids and kids of any age and teens are going to probably struggle with that. They're used to switching from activity to activity at school. And so scheduling in break times um, in order to accommodate and give their brains a rest and get their bodies moving um, is going to be really important. Um, one thing that some parents have found helpful is if you are doing work with your child at home, using a timer to do what they call homework sprints. So that means setting the timer, having your child work on the work for until that timer goes off consistently. And then when the timer goes off, they can kind of take a small break. They're not kids are not very good at self managing their time. And so by doing something like that, it'll help them focus for a short period of time, knowing that they get a break. Um, start small with the younger kids and kind of work your way up based on what your child's able to do. Um, 
it's the breaks are going to be important for the child, but they're also going to be important for you. If you are helping your child do learning at home, um, you're probably going to need a break as well. So again, with the cut yourself some slack, you're going to need some breaks too. So make sure those are in there, not just for your child's sake, but for your own sake as well. Um, if you're able to get up and move, listen to some music, do something like that um, together during those times to refresh the child's attention and um, have an emotion reset, especially for frustrating or difficult material, that can be really helpful. Um, <clears throat> communicate with teachers as much as possible. I know I've heard from families varied um, levels of participation on video calls with schools. I kind of look at it as the very least, then your child is getting to see their teacher and see their classmates, regardless of if it's helping them do the, the work. But obviously, it's up to up to you and what works for your family. Um, but if if you need help contacting your child's teacher or school on how to best help them learn the material from home, if you're finding that they're struggling, um, this is one thing that a lot of parents have been struggling with because we're, you know, the re those of us who are not normally teachers um, are not trained to be able to do this in a way that's that's helpful for kids. And so relying on teachers to give tips can be um, can help kind of bridge that gap. I think um, another thing that's really important is having a designated school space. If you're going to be doing virtual learning into the fall, um, we can kind of view this as this isn't really temporary anymore. We're clearly taking another chunk of time to do this. And so having a designated workspace with minimal distractions so that kids can really focus their attention. Um, when we do tasks, our brain is kind of very influenced by our environment. And so kids are going to probably have a hard time focusing on school when they're at home if they're not normally homeschooled. And so having a space that's just dedicated to this is where we sit when we do our school work, um, trying to eliminate distractions, um, trying for it to not be overstimulating. So um, next to the TV is usually not a good option because there's sound, there's light, there's things to pull their attention away from what they're doing. And then um, one thing that some of the kids I've worked with have run into is um, the need to kind of maybe separate younger siblings who are not school aged away from the schoolwork because um, kids are having a hard time, you know, learning new skills as it is. And it's really hard for, you know, Johnny to learn how to write when his baby sister is trying to eat the crayons that he's holding. So um, having a separate space that they can focus on their schoolwork can be really important. And then one one other thing is, um, as a parent, if you're concerned about virtual learning, is be proactive. A lot of the schools, at least in our area, are still trying to figure this out and and struggling to find a procedure and, an, and a method of instruction that's going to be helpful. And so some of this may um, really fall on parent advocacy. Um, so is it possible to set up virtual study groups for the kids, maybe among the parents, or have a parent classroom contact list where you can ask each other for support um, if there's something that you're having a hard time working with your child on? So parents, uh, don't be afraid to be advocates for your child. Um, the schools are really trying to play catch up right now as well. And so um, some of these things may be fall through the cracks if we're not pushing for them. And so that could be one thing to keep in mind as well, is what do you feel like you need from the school and be vocal about that. And then um, winding down here, I think this is our last kind of skills-based slide here, is social skills. I've gotten a lot of questions about social skills for young kids um, and how it's going to be impacted by the pandemic by things being closed and especially by schools being closed. And so there are different ways that kids can learn social skills without being in a classroom at school. There is, I put it on the, the next slide, which has the resources, but there was a New York Times article that I found very helpful that um, talked about research that was done that showed that although this is a new situation we're in, there are other situations in which kids are out of school for a period of time or miss out on social interactions. And all of those things suggest that kids are going to be able to catch up and be okay um, because we're social beings and we're wired to, um, to be social. And so all of that, those research on things like um, frequent moving or hospitalizations of children with illnesses, um, the research that they've done kind of shows that kids are able to bounce back in the social realm. And so parents, um, 
can maybe take a, take a breath and um, not be as worried as they have been about their child falling behind in social skills because um, they probably will catch up. So some things you can do at home during this time would be um, using reading um, or watching TVs or TV shows or movies and talking with your child about what's happening in the plot, how the characters are are dealing with friendships um, or conflicts and ask, engaging your child in a conversation of, do you think that was helpful or an unhelpful choice? Um, have you ever experienced something like that? What would you do if that happened to you? It gets that part of their brain working that deals with social skills, even though they're not ex directly experiencing that event. Um, and then, you know, where comfortable for you and where appropriate and safe, um, setting up social interactions when you, when or where you can. So um, video calls with friends. I've seen a lot of families doing outdoor play dates where they'll be outside and still kind of stay at a distance. So like riding our bikes at the park, but we still can kind of talk to each other and see each other from a distance. And then if you um, want to visit an old school method, um, actually sending things in the mail. I know we don't really do that anymore, but almost like a pen pal system of having your child draw a picture for their friend and actually physically sending it to them. It's not something that people think of doing anymore, but the families that I've suggested that to have really enjoyed it. Um, and then if there are activities, depending on what area you live in, some activities in the community are functioning. You know, if it's something that you really feel strongly your child should participate in, if it's safe and appropriate, um, joining those types of things. But um, overall, there are ways to kind of work on social skills without, without the school setting for those of those of us whose um, areas are doing virtual learning. Okay, so this is my lovely resources page um, that lists the major things I've mentioned in the presentation, some of the links. Um, my favorite book about feelings uh, in my heart, Read Aloud, is on there. YouTube has been an amazing resource during this time. You can find so many kids' books being read aloud by teachers or librarians or just parents on there about any type of feeling or social situation. So if you have something that you're really not sure how to explain to your child or that you want to work on with them, Googling on or searching on YouTube, children's book, read aloud, and then that topic, you can usually find, um, find some really good ones. I've got Go Noodle on here, Sesame Street's website, as well as um, a Sesame Street app called Breathe, Think, Do, which teaches kids deep breathing and problem solving. And then that um, New York Times article I talked about is on the bottom for anyone interested in looking that up. All right, and that's that's kind of the end of, of my talking. So um, I think we're gonna take questions and I'll pop myself back on the screen here. Awesome. That, that was wonderful, Courtney. Really, really, really was. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind turning off the slides there. Oh, sure. Yeah. Here we go. I, 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 have, a, I have a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on, the, uh, on the list of activities uh, that you have listed, uh, there is physical play and movement activity. Mm -hmm. what, what's the difference between the two? Oh, the, so I don't know if there's an official difference. That's how I categorize it. Is physical mm -hmm. play I put more as like sports, um, playing on a on a play set, like running, jumping, um, that kind of play versus movement activities. I kind of put in the more um, like directed movement, like yoga. So something that's more more um, slow and controlled versus physical play being mm -hmm. more like free and quick and fast, like running around with a ball. Um, or going up and down a slide at the park and things like that, that's really high energy. The movement is kind of more of a controlled controlled activities. So like some of those Zumba things or, um, or the yoga. I kind of separated those out because with physical play, kids are usually doing more of free play. And so yeah. if you're trying to, that doesn't always work out if you're, if you're having to stay inside. Um, that day. So playing soccer in the house is not always an option. So doing some of those more controlled movement um, is a better option for families who can't get outside. I got it. I got it. Thank you. I have a few questions here. Uh, my grandson is age four, has been crying uh, four, five, six times a day and fearful of everything, even phone calls. Uh, uh, mom gets not giving undivided attention to him and uh, 
she's worried about things. Uh, what sort of advice do you have to this child who is clearly very stressed out and fearful about everything that's going on? Um, so a couple of things you can do is um, main, maintaining consistency at home. So if kids are being more feel, fearful in general, having unpredictability tends to set them off a little bit more. Um, for some of those things that maybe trigger him, like phone calls or having to not pay attention to what he's doing, um, providing kind of matter of fact reassurance. So, oh, that's just a phone call. I have to talk to them for a minute. And then when I'm done, I'm going to come play with you. So really narrating almost what's going to happen. Um, kids still do sometimes struggle with not having attention. And so you might still see some of that crying behavior, but just trying to be as calm yourself as you can when responding to it. Um, kids really take cues off of adults. And so if they see that um, we're able to see a situation as okay, a lot of times the child will feed off of that cue as well. Um, having those structured routines can be helpful in that as well. So if there's times when you know you have to, you know, take phone calls or do certain things, having them set up with an activity during it. Um, and then just providing as much kind of um, reassurance of what's going on as you can. So explaining the situation, explaining why we have to do something. And particularly if there's any kind of COVID related fears, just keep explaining you know what what we're doing to make sure we're staying safe so um, that kind of helps provide kids with more of a sense of control in some of those areas and so um some of those small things can be really helpful cool question about uh, how stressful would it be uh would it be for a six-year-old uh, to change school that has more days of attendance than offered in public school how, okay so how stressful it would be um you know the the thing that's crazy about young kids is they're they're so they might not like change all the time but they're really adaptable and so i have actually had a few families that i'm working with say that they're planning on switching schools and most of the time especially at the young ages kids cope with that just fine um because they're not they haven't necessarily had like years and years established in that same place. Um, for the most part, kids are able to cope with those changes in schools pretty easily, especially if you're able to explain to them and prepare them ahead of time of what the change is going to be, um, and where they're going to be going, what they're going to be doing during the day. Usually new schools after a week or so, kids have, have adjusted and they're kind of like, oh, well, this is just the new normal now. Um, and so I would think that would be a pretty manageable stress um, stressor for a child. Um, in general, at that age, it is pretty, kids are pretty adaptable to changing schools and things like that. Cool. So, um, a practical question, and I actually have that question myself. Uh, uh, I often go around running and I see playgrounds area and I uh, sometimes see families there. The question is, uh, do you think that playgrounds are reasonably safe? That's a tricky question. Um, I think depending on what community and you'd probably have to reference either the parks and recreation um, plan in your own community, because I think it also depends on, I, I'm not a medical expert, obviously, so I, <laughs> I would defer to what they're saying. Um, if your community doesn't have that posted somewhere of like what measures they're taking or what they're recommending, um, trying to seek out that information. And then if you're feeling, if you personally are feeling comfortable taking your child to a playground, um, just what measures you would like to have. So are you still going to require, you know, wearing a mask from your child at the playground or just making sure we're taking hand washing breaks or um, something like that. But I think it, it's community specific based on, you know, population in the area who's using it and what the COVID presence is like in your area. Um, and so at least in my area, most of the parks have been like um, the cities online have been posting recommendations about the play spaces. Um, but if yours isn't, I would find a way to seek that out from the city organizers on what they feel would be appropriate. I think the health departments and almost those communities mm -hmm. in the United States have really been posting this kind of information mm -hmm. and also and also and also identifying uh, the the level of alertness mm -hmm. in each community in regard to how 
how uh, much of a problem COVID is in that area. Um, there's a question about mixed messages that uh, sometimes the kids have. Uh, you have parents that don't have the same uh, ideas about uh, this infection and how serious it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and you have a parent who tends to be more, uh, uh, um, more, uh, uh, more nonchalant about it. Uh, and so the kids are getting two messages and also they're probably exposed to other information coming in from news media mm -hmm. and whatever sources. How do you address that? Well, depending on the age of the of the child we're talking about um, and how much they're able to think for themselves about certain topics. So, for instance, you know, a teenager, you may be able to present them both sides of an argument and they can kind of draw their own conclusions. Um, some older children as well. But the younger kids, that is kind of tricky. Um, you can, you know, for the most part, kids are pretty receptive and, and can understand, you know, if two adults in their life are are not agreeing on something they're usually fully aware of that fact and so having kind of a matter of fact talk about well you know i feel this way and so and so thinks this way um and then among the adults i think if possible trying to come to a compromise about about um what you want for the child and if not able to do that together is there someone who can maybe mediate that conversation um, a little bit because at, at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to um, how much is the how much is the conflict about the differing ideas stressing out the child, let alone you know the the stuff related to COVID. So um, sometimes being a part of those disagreements is more stressful for the child than anything else. Um, and so trying to find a way to come to a compromise, or if if necessary, maybe involve um, somebody to mediate that conversation and decide what's what's kind of best it is it is a tricky it is a tricky spot to be in um often if you're trying to initiate that conversation with someone who's disagreeing my my biggest recommendation for that like among the adults is to really focus on um what's important for the child and keep the conversation on what works for the child not accusing each other of you know this that or the other thing is it usually goes smoother than if you kind of point to the other person and say, well, you, you know, feel this. Um, so trying to keep it focused on the child and um, for kids who are in school, one easy way to do that is to, you know, just kind of point out for kids, consistency is usually the, the easiest way to go. And so whatever measures school is taking, let's try to have those same measures be in all of our activities so that, um, the child knows what to expect across the board. So um, at the very least for a parent who, or, or another caregiver who maybe isn't taking COVID as seriously, at the very least we do need kids to be able to function when they go out in the community and when they go to school. So how are we gonna help them learn how to do that regardless of your personal kind of feelings about where, what this pandemic is? Cool, thank you. Uh, a question about, uh, uh, anger and sometimes the, the children are showing uh, uh, a great deal of anger and frustrations over what's happening because they're not able to see their friends they're not able to do certain things and uh, taking out those angers either against their parents or against one of their siblings and showing that anger is in in ways that sometimes is violent mm -hmm. uh how do you how do you uh, address that and um you know, it 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 is. You are some. You got to be sympathetic, like you said, with the fact that there are definitely changes in the way their life is taking place, but the way they are reacting to it is really uh, uh, not not healthy. Right. Um, so for for older kids and teens, having a very frank conversation when the child is calm not not in the middle of the conflict, right? Because that's only going to usually make things worse. Um, when when they're calm and pointing out you know it's okay to feel angry i understand why you're feeling angry but your be your behavior is dangerous right now um or something to that effect and then try to come up with a plan of what what they can do what is a productive way to cope with that feeling for the younger kids you may again the books are usually the way i go um reading a book about what anger is and how it's okay to feel angry but we have to do something else with it and using some of those coping skills. So for all ages, 
um, this could work, but particularly for the young kids, what I usually do is create um, what I call our, our mad menu. So when we're feeling mad, here are the list of things I can do with it. Um, most of the time, even for the older kids, the adult is going to have to be the one forcing the child to kind of step away from the conflict. Um, and so, and, and kind of making them do, do some of the activities, they're not going to probably have the self-discipline to recognize like, oh, I'm getting really upset. I better go take a walk. They're probably not going to do that. So, um, intervening and kind of practicing with them. Okay. When we're feeling mad, what are we going to do? And kind of having a list of things that we can we can do to kind of cool off or calm down. And then um, oftentimes we'll recommend having a space in the home, like a calm down space. So a designated area that someone can be in when they want, want or need alone time um, or just when they're not being safe around others to, until they're able to kind of cool off. So a spot away from other, other people, other um, kids in the home um, that's kind of quiet and they can do kind of a chosen activity until they're ready to re readdress um, the situation. And for caregivers, I would say to try to avoid having a conversation with the child about what's not going well with their reaction in the moment. Wait until they've calmed down and talk about it later. Um, and then for any kids who are really kind of still having a concerning level of that violence or aggression, then maybe seeking some support services. Sometimes it just does take another person coming in and working with the child um, to help to help that, especially when we're all kind of stuck at home right now um, with each other 24-7, um, sometimes having that fresh perspective or having someone other than mom or dad or grandma being the one talking to you about it can help a lot um, and be a lot less uh, tense of a conversation. Yeah, thank you, Courtney. Uh, here's a tricky question here for you is that, uh, what is the best way to work uh, if you are a teacher and a parent and mm -hmm. uh, both of you are doing remote learning you know but mm -hmm. uh, here is the catch i work in another school district from where my daughter goes to school yes <laughs> um i actually have come across this situation yeah. myself as well um in working with families and it's a it's a very tricky position for parents to be in honestly um, even if you were in the same district or, or, you know, even teaching that grade, like most parents who are teachers, unless you're choosing to homeschool your child, like you're not necessarily meant to be your child's teacher. And so even people with the degree and the ability to teach professionally, um, are struggling to teach their own child. Cause you know, from a kid's perspective, it's different coming from mom or, you know, my aunt or whoever than it is from, from another party. So, um, if there is a way to kind of um, break up the two the two days and separate them, I know that's not I'm not sure you know what that would look like in your specific school district or your child's school. But if there's a way to um, have designated times where you're just focusing on your work and then later you know they're focusing on their work, um, or help them figure out how to how to work at the same time that you're having to get your work done. Um, that homework sprint technique that I talked about could be helpful in that area. So setting a timer and saying, okay, I, I can't help you for the next five minutes because I gotta do my stuff. So you just focus on that and I'll answer any questions you have when the timer goes off. Um, and then over time, expanding how much time is on the timer. So starting really small, but expanding that over time so that you have a little sprint for yourself to be able to get your something something done for you um, but that of course only, only works if you're able to manage your own time. I'm not, it, it also depends on like what, what your job duties require of you. I don't think there's a really easy answer, um, for that, unfortunately. Um, your child's teacher may be a good person to ask since they're also teaching, um, virtually. Mm -hmm. And so they may be a good person to ask of like, how can I make this work? for both of us um, and see what insight since they know your child's curriculum and also maybe we'll have a, a bit more insight into what you're going through as well. Um, they may have a possible a possible strategy that I can't think of right now for helping with that. The interesting part about uh, uh, this, the impact of COVID with us staying at home with, uh, with uh, our kids and uh, the question is, uh, should there be on the list of the agenda items that you've talked about 
uh, especially maybe around dinner meal, around meal time, around socialization time, for everybody to talk together about this and share their fears and concerns. Yeah. And trying to trying to reflect on that uh, in, a, in a in a very you know uh, uh, open manner and uh, very very in a situation where no one is feel threatened, no one feel mm -hmm. uh, you know so. You, you feel that that's really important to have those kind of dialogues. Definitely. And I think having it as a part of your daily routine, if, if that's something your family is able to do, that is excellent. Um, doing Talking about feelings in general, whether it's related to COVID or related to, you know, just day-to-day -day anger that kids have, um, doing it in a at a neutral time usually gets the best productivity out of that conversation because tensions aren't mm -hmm. running high. Kids especially are so um, in the moment um, at, at pretty much any age, even through adolescence, that if we try to have that type of productive conversation with them when they're still in that feeling of anger, it's probably not going to process in the same way. And so having those daily conversations and that's um, things that we'll do with kids, you know, as, as young as two, um, in the family just to kind of practice hearing those types of things. Even if they can't contribute much to the conversation, their brain is processing everything that's going on. And so that's going to help them build a foundation for being able to self-reflect as they get older. Um, self-reflection is a skill and kids have to learn it. Um, and it's a muscle almost that needs to be stretched. And if we don't practice it, they're not going to be effective at doing it. Um, and so having those conversations within the family, um, can help them learn how to do that either by watching others or being challenged to participate and do it themselves. Um, so having those daily conversations is at dinner time or just before bedtime is a popular one as well um, can be can be awesome. And I've also encouraged families to incorporate not only some of the negative things that are going on, but also make a point to talk about something positive that's going on that day. Um, yeah. Talk about what what you really like that your child did or um, something that has gone well or something that you did as a family that was creative that helped overcome an obstacle that you had recently. So also highlighting those, um, looking at those positive things as well to kind of show, you know, yes, we have some of these challenges going on, but also here's here's a way to look at some of the great things that are coming out of this. Right. One last question is about screen time, uh, mm -hmm. children. You know, how do you monitor to control that? And do we need to set a limit? So um, under normal circumstances, I know it's a lot easier to uh, monitor for working parents right now. I know that has been a struggle when you're working at home and also trying to monitor what your child is doing. Um, usually kind of coming up with a family screen, screen time plan of like, you know, based on what parents you know, what your belief is about how much your kids should be using it or even consulting with pediatricians about how much screen time. Um, there's a lot of resources online too with um, with that, but having kind of a set, having that be part of the routine. So screen time, whether it be TV, tablet, that's maybe just on the routine and we do it for that part of the day and then it's gone. Um, also having for older kids who can maybe manage their own their own screen use a little bit more than like the little kids can um, just kind of having a family expectation and contract of how much we're going to. And when I say contract, I actually mean, you know, writing it out, you know, and so it's, it's right there and everybody's going to follow it um, for what the rules are. And I also have been telling parents again with that cut yourself some slack thing, um, be realistic on what you can manage um, as well. I do know that with having split roles of having to work at home and also keep um, keep track of your kids and things like that. I have had some parents feeling um, some guilt over, oh, I let them watch more TV today because I needed to get something done. And sometimes you just, you gotta do what you gotta do to get your daily life um, tasks done. Um, so just kind of having a, a structure to it though can be really helpful on setting the limits. Timers work wonders um, for kids of all ages because then it's not like, oh, mom just decided I'm done with my tablet. It's, oh, my time is up. Um, and the more structure you can give to it, the less over time, the less of a fight you'll hopefully see when you have to end the screen time. Uh so much. This was incredibly informative, incredibly helpful. 
I learned a lot from it. I know all of us, all of us have. Uh, thank you, uh, Courtney Clark from the Pelfin Clinic in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And thanks for all you do. And please keep up the good work. It's been a pleasure. Thank you all for joining us on this webinar. And I look forward to seeing you, seeing you again in future webinars. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.